I don't want no oil. A spoil in my shoreline. I like fish much better than crud. I like birds and things. A creeping and crawling. Won't trade no more oil for blood. The sun don't give us all we need to make this country run. But that black demon oil's got us fussing and fighting, and I do believe it's time we was done. I don't want them nukes run by them pooks who think radioactivity is fun. No more three-headed frogs or kids with leukemia. Nuclear power ain't fit. Good morning, Toledo, and good afternoon, Columbus, and hello to those of you listening on the internet, wherever and where, whenever you are. This is Joe Demar and Rebecca Wood, and you have tuned into For a Green Future. For a Green Future is a show where we talk about ecology and the environment, and we talk about them in terms of how they're going to affect you, your family, your pocketbook, your health, your happiness, uh, because we are dependent on the environment for our health and happiness. I mean, we like to think that uh, we're dependent on air conditioners for our health and happiness. Which we kind of are at the moment. We kind of are at the moment, <laughs> but behind that, yeah. there's the, the, the environment. You know, you could have a, a great air conditioner, but, you know, if you're on the moon, for example, it's not going to do you any good because there's no air to cool. So, And I brought up the moon because yesterday was the 50th anniversary of the moon landing, and we're going to be talking about that a little bit uh, at 866-240-1065. You can call in with your memories of that uh, amazing event 50 years ago, if you have them. Uh, and uh, it's a good show. We're going to have, we have a special guest, Jim Witter, is going to be calling in at about 8.15. And Jim Witter works for the Wood County Park District, and he leads uh, hikes that are health hikes that, that get people the health benefits of being out in the woods and being out in nature. And so we're going to be talking a little bit about that that mind body nature connection. So uh, that should be interesting. That's at 8:15. Then uh, we'll hear from our terrific sponsors, and then we'll have a little bit of an update about, about House Bill 6. Some very significant things happened this past week. Uh and then uh we're going to talk some more about various things that are happening in in the environmental news. And hopefully at some point we'll hear from you guys at 866-240-1065. But uh, right now, the beginning of the show, we're going to be talking about yesterday was the 50th anniversary of Neil Armstrong's walk on the moon, on the, on the, the moon landing. And uh, I am, I guess I should can admit this, I'm 57 years old. And so I was seven years old when this happened doing the math. I, luckily, I can still do math, even though I'm 57. <laughs> and uh, it was just an a amazing time for for not just America, but for the world. Um, do you have any memory? I don't know if you... A little bit. Uh, I was born in 66, so I was, what, two or three then? Mm-hmm. Okay. Here yeah. I remember seeing it. I, I remember the grown-ups were all excited, and I thought it was really, really boring because it was just <laughs> this grainy footage of, you know, this little guy in some machinery against this blank white background. And I was like, mm-hmm. yes, yeah, mm-hmm. so what? Get, I want to go – when is when – is, uh, when is cartoons coming on? <laughs> right. <laughs> I, I'm not sure I completely. I saw a documentary at the, at the museum uh, last summer. The museum was doing a lot of like outdoor movies projecting on the wall of the glass pavilion, and uh, they did one about the anniversary of the space landing. And I think the thing I really loved about that was that you got to see the astronauts playing a lot. 
Ah, they mm-hmm. were hopping around like bunnies and you know doing oh look if I in zero gravity I can flip over and over and over and and I guess I'd always thought of you know astronauts as very serious military I don't vaguely athletic people and they were just being goofy and I love that <laughs> <laughs> yeah there's there's a lot of goofiness in, in the astronaut corps I mean <laughs> you don't just think about it but but it's definitely there and in fact I, I rewatched the the landing video last night on on uh, NASA's YouTube channel, and I, I had caught something that I had missed all the other times I've listened to it, and that is at one time Armstrong went off camera to go get some rock samples, and but he kept talking, and he just at one point he just casually mentioned, "Wow, you could really throw rocks a long ways here on the moon." <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, oh, that's great. Yeah, he just stopped <laughs> taking his samples and just. You know, whipped one, and yeah. <laughs> who knows how far it went. I mean, one sixth Earth gravity, it probably went like the length of two football fields. I don't know. Um, but I went actually went to Wapakoneta last night or yesterday because that is the birthplace of Neil Armstrong, and they have an air and space museum down there. And uh, it was amazing because what they did was they had the jumbotron going, and they showed the. CBS news reports, the live CBS news reports from that time at exactly the same time. So, you know, July 20th, 1969, and they matched the times up exactly. So like at 4.05 here, it was 4.05 back then. And and so they showed the moon landing, and I was remembering things from when I was seven that were just, uh, it was just, you know, I got chills, I got goosebumps, and when... When they actually landed, I, I got tears, and people were cheering. There were a couple hundred, several hundred people there, and everybody was cheering, and it was it was like being back then. And actually, one thing I did remember from being a kid <laughs> was that, of course, they didn't have live film of the ship landing. All they had was an, an animation that CBS had done, oh. and it was a, it was a terrific animation. But I remember as a seven-year-old sitting there saying, I, they should have a camera on this. <laughs> really? Why, why, why aren't we – why are we watching this dumb cartoon? But the cameras were on the spaceship, so right. you can't plant a camera on the moon to catch the landing of the spaceship before you have been to the moon, I'm pretty sure. Right. Yeah, yeah. true. And you can't have another <laughs> spaceship flying alongside the main spaceship filming it. Today we would, <laughs> and we would have a documentary about the making of the moon landing and all this <laughs> stuff, but not then. Yeah, right. So – uh, but it was it was amazing, and uh, I actually wrote a little piece here. It's just uh, five paragraphs. So, and since this is my show, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and read it really quick. Um, and uh, if you guys, if any of you have uh, memories of the moon landing at eight six six two four zero one zero six five, and you might wonder why we're talking so much about landing on the moon on an environmental show, on an ecology show. Well, uh, this that's what this little essay that I wrote is going to okay. see it's going to show the segue it's going to make a lot of sense all right so here we go uh, today or yesterday was the 50th anniversary of the Apollo moon landing even though I was only seven at the time the experience deeply moved me as it did everyone living on earth I knew all the acronyms that NASA used like LEM lunar excursion module I also knew all the complicated steps and stages of the flight and was able to follow along the whole journey It's difficult to convey to this generation just what a miraculous and wonderful experience the moon landing was for the entire human race. Yes, it was a product of the Cold War. There was an ideological battle being played out all over the globe to prove that elected democracy was a better way of governing ourselves than communist dictatorship. But when we actually won the race, when we actually got to the moon, it was the entire human race that shared in that success. Everyone everywhere was transfixed by the sight of two men matter-of-factly achieving what had only been the most outlandish fantasy for tens of thousands of years. From the Apollo missions came the Earthrise photos. These were photos that showed us that we are all living together on a beautiful, tiny little sphere, spinning all alone together in an unimaginably large universe. From the moon, the Earth looks incredibly fragile and delicate with its wispy cloud systems and precarious mix of land and sea. We now know that it is. Traveling to the moon taught us how difficult it is to create and maintain the narrow range of conditions humans need to survive. Temperature, 
the mixture of gases in the air, water, food, having to create the systems that provided these things to the astronauts, even for a few days, required the combined expertise of tens of thousands of people and incredible amounts of resources. It's no coincidence the the Environmental Protection Agency was created a few years later. The moon landing brought us together in a way nothing ever had before. The United States did not claim the moon as its territory. It was incredibly important that Neil Armstrong stated that we had come in peace for mankind and not for the benefit of any one group of us. Even though we were then, as now, embroiled in wars and many other kinds of conflicts, for that moment we realized that we were all one race. That awareness was reinforced during the Apollo 13 missions when we were united again in praying for the safe return of the astronauts in danger of dying in space. So, I grew up blessed and cursed with the knowledge that we, as a race, can do almost any things we set our mind to. We can provide food, shelter, and education to everyone on Earth. We can prevent the destruction of the planet and the death of our beautiful biosphere. Humans can colonize the moon and Mars. We have the intelligence, technology, and determination. Let's do it. So Definitely. Oh, I, 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 this one poet friend of mine, Arnie Kester, has this wonderful sort of a lengthy prose poem that he does about that, the connection between Earth Day and, and the moon and everything. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I saw you give me a, a thumbs up there, Rebecca. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, that's, it, Couldn't everyone hear that? <laughs> <laughs> but it's, Yeah, very... Um, yeah, so uh, what do you think? Do you remember the moonshot? Do you um, do you agree that that this is that the moonshot was something that sort of proved to us how fragile life is and, and how important it is to to protect it? Um, one other thing they had going at the uh, Wapakoneta was they had NASA TV going, and so they had Vice President Pence's speech on the moonshot. Uh, the gave. following program is paid uh, for on. by you Michael gotta, Gonzalez. The opinions no, expressed I'm are solely sorry. those of the host and not those Michael of Cumulus Gonzalez Media. Michael Gonzalez did not pay for this show. <laughs> and uh, it's not his fault. <laughs> no, Michael Gonzalez actually pays for the next right. half hour, or the next hour. He'll be on at probably at 9 o'clock with the cheap seats. So those of you waiting anxiously for sports to come back, don't worry. It's just 45 minutes off or so. So, um, but... My point was that Pence was there, uh, and he was giving – I only caught part of his speech because it was hot and it wasn't really worth standing in the sun to watch that. Uh, but he – it's kind of like he was doing – it's almost as if he read my essay and did the uh, and said the opposite. Oy. Yeah, because <laughs> he was saying – this was an American achievement, and America is, you know, was first, and America, America, America – and because we're not human beings, we're just Americans. And I was, I was wondering, wasn't he there? Yeah. <laughs> Which moon landing did he watch? I mean, I, I, you know, those of us who actually saw it, we were humans that day. Everyone on the planet, there were people were watching literally all over the world. Uh, you know, they they were showing shots of people in huge crowds watching it on, on giant screens in Paris and and the Vatican and and China and, you know, literally everyone on the world in the world was involved in that. And it was something good that the human race had done with technology at a time when we were trying really hard to destroy ourselves with technology. Right. There and was some wisdom as well as just, uh, you know, book learning and, and, and tinkering going on there that we're good at. Right. Yeah. And, and so, you know, so I, I was very disappointed with Vice President Pence's Apollo you know, the, the viewers are missing speech. my eye rolling too, aren't they, Joe? <laughs> they are, but it's 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 impressive, I have to say. <laughs> okay, well, we are at eight sixteen, and I see we have a caller on the line, and our able technician is picking up the phone as we speak. And I, I'm assuming that this is our guest, Jim Witter, so we will shortly be talking to him about um, the connection between nature and health. And, you know, the the astronauts were up there. They were about as far from nature as you could get. Um, And, oh, wait, our our technician just threw up his hand. So wait a minute. The lights were blinking. All right, so if Jim Witter's listening, 
uh, Jim, just try again. Just call right back again at 866-240-1065, and uh, we will we will be talking to you shortly. Actually, Rebecca, I'm going to send Jim a, a little text message, so if you could take over the mic. Okie dokie. All right. Yeah, I, uh, I, I had questions written down to ask Jim. I, I, uh, I don't know. I don't know if it's true or not. I haven't looked up the science, but, uh, I think maybe that thing might be true about how if you walk on grass, it's supposed to be good for you and do something great for your electrical flow in your body or your depression or something. I don't know. I like walking on grass. It feels good. It feels like a nice massage, whereas, when you're walking on grass in shoes, it, it, it kind of feels like you're fighting it, you know, because your shoes aren't made for that and it's not fun. But if you take them off and walk across the courthouse lawn, for example, then it, it, it feels nice. It feels like something you'd pay for even. So I always like that. Well, I, I think that was uh, widely publicized in that movie Pretty Woman and that one scene where the guy's walking on grass and barefoot and and he just became a whole different person. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> he changed his entire outlook. He, he stopped focusing on money and started right. focusing on Instantly, Julia Roberts, yeah. you know. <laughs> okay. Uh, we have we do have a caller on the line, and our, our able technician is talking with him. And I get a thumbs up here. Jim Witter, are you on the line? Yep, I'm here. All right. And did I pronounce your name correctly? Yeah, you got it, Jim Witter. Okay. Well, Jim, thanks for joining us here on For a Green Future. And um, could you just tell us a little bit about yourself in terms of, you know, who you officially are and, and so forth? Yes. So I am the program coordinator at Wood County Park District. Uh, so really it's a, a naturalist kind of uh, nature education just with you know, some more <laughs> administrative duties layered on top. But basically... I'm a naturalist and in charge of, yeah, uh, coordinating the programs, and that's uh, everything from uh, public programs to you know, scout groups, uh, school field trip visits, uh, garden clubs, mm. uh, any kind of uh, other kind of folks who are interested in coming out and uh, learning about the uh, natural world, about what's going on at the park. Ah, cool. Well, and uh, in the interest of full disclosure, I, I would say that Wood County Park District is one of our sponsors here on uh, For a Green Future, and we'll be hearing a little more about that at the bottom of the hour. But I brought you on to talk about a very specific topic, and that is the, the whole body-nature connection, the whole health and nature um, uh, connection there. I, I think that it's, it seems like research is showing that this is actually a, a very important thing for human health is to get exposed to nature on a regular basis. Is is that true? Yeah, you know, it, it is, and uh, it's interesting that um, people have kind of, you know, intuitively known this maybe for a while, but it's kind of like hard, hard to grasp. It was one of, kind of those you know, tree huggery kind of things. Oh yeah, you know those, those tree huggers. You're know, going out in the in the forest. You know, walking around. Uh, but uh, well, we don't we don't discourage tree hugging on For a Green Future. But <laughs> but, but, but yeah, but I see your point though. Yes, yes. go on. It's the urge to see. And we do at the uh, of course of the Wood County Parks uh, too. We, we, we're all about uh, tree hugging. But mm -hmm. uh, in trying to kind of connect it for for people who who are not who are always trying to trying to reach out to. Uh, and maybe folks are just a little bit more, you know, kind of, you know, show me the science. You know, you got this, you know, oh, I feel good, but, you know, uh, what's it all about? That uh, in the last 15 or 20 years, uh, there's been more and more kind of scientific research on how this actually does improve uh, health prospects and your actual, like, physiology. Uh, you know, everything from, you know, just, uh, you know, breathing in uh, tree compounds uh, from a forest actually improves things like uh, wow. blood pressure uh, hmm. and things like that, your actual biological processes, as well, of course, in decreasing kind of stress and anxiety, you know, affecting your brain processes, uh, too. In fact, there was just an article in Scientific Reports just from last month that was talking about, uh, you know, people sort of self-reporting on, you know, how much time it's been outside uh, and up to, I think they found up to 200 to 300 minutes a week. And after that, I guess that you, you exhausted your, 
with your your uh, uh, health outcomes, but for people that spent uh, that much time, they did find that uh, they're reporting uh, better health outcomes. Uh, and it's also been, you know, studied pretty well uh, in Japan uh, and Finland. Uh, you know, actually, uh, in, in uh, Japan, uh, they have something called uh, forest bathing, uh, hmm. where uh, they're, yes, uh, kind of, and, and we've tried to incorporate it uh, to, into even some of the parks programs. We have a forest bathing program that's led by uh, an official instructor. So pretty much sort of meditative, just spending time out there. Uh, being quiet, and um, we we have that, and we found that you know it, it definitely does you know improve your health prospects for, from the parks perspective. And you're mentioning the kind of the mind body uh, connection. I started a kind of a series of hikes called uh, it was originally called the Senior Nature Hike Series, and I'm, I know some folks that you know readily identify seniors. Yep, yep, that's me. I'm a senior, and other people are like. I will never be a senior as long <laughs> as I live. Don't, don't call me that. So I, I changed it to hiking for health. It kind of, the, the idea was, you know, a lot of people, maybe some of more we call uh, them are passive users. So they're not coming to a program, but maybe they're walking or running, or walking the dog, or just kind of, you know, moving around the park. Um, and, you know, there, there's an exercise component there, you know, even, you know, without, you know, being in one of the natural areas. And so, you know, getting outside, of course, and just, you know, playing exercise. But then you combine that with, you know, a natural sled hike and learning some things about your parks, even visiting different parks that maybe you've never been to and seen. And uh, you're, you know, learning things there as well as you know, connecting with, with other people. So it's kind of multi-pronged that you get just the exercise, moving around. Uh, you're out there, you know, in, in the woods, you know, enjoying that kind of therapeutic effect. Uh, you're learning some things. Maybe hopefully I'm uh, telling you some things that they're interesting to you and keeping your attention and mm -hmm. and, and uh, are, are are useful and meaningful. Uh, and then yeah, just uh, you know talking to other people, talking to the, the program leader, and kind of a social connection there. So I'm trying to check a lot of boxes off there. Hmm. Yeah. So that that does sound really great. And it, I think that you know we've known for a long time that that trees and plants give off a lot more than just pollen you know that they there's they put out a lot of chemicals into the air and uh you know when you go past a field of clover and you take that deep breath because you can smell the clover and uh so now it's turning out that those things actually have a physical impact on us they, they, it's not just oh that's kind of nice it's like it, it really not only makes you feel better it, it actually makes you more healthy to get exposed to it. That's really incredible information. Yeah, it, it is. And um, when they sort of study these things, uh, they find that uh, kind of some of those larger areas, if, if you can't do anything else other than, you know, kind of be in, in your backyard, then, you know, you can do that. that that's good. But um, they even compared um, kind of exercising in an urban environment, which is, which is good. You, you, you want to do that. Let me go ahead and exercise wherever it might be. Uh, is a good thing. And then they uh, compared that, though, exercising in an urban environment and to exercising uh, in more of kind of a, a nature preserve or somewhere uh, just a little bit more more wild, uh, kind of out with a lot more uh, woods and trees, natural habitats, and found that uh, there is an increased benefit from exercising. Uh, like we see a lot of folks uh, at the Wood County Parks exercising in natural areas. Uh, and so that's kind of uh, interesting, too. And, and also, I've had a, a couple of conversations with uh, some people. I know that I think there's more and more uh, of a movement to kind of always think about uh, kind of you know natural areas that it's good to get out in those, um, and then our urbanized environments. You know, we, we've kind of you know let, let those go. Okay, well this is the, the nature's out there, and, and you know our downtown areas and urban areas. You know, it's you know it is what it is. It's you know kind of uh, you know, lots of concrete and you know, parking lots and buildings. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, some cities have, you know, tried to do more uh, in you know, your urban forestry, trying to have more green spaces just within your city. Of course, you know, one of the most famous examples is you know, Central Park there mm -hmm. in, in New York City. And often you hear about, you know, what a neat place, you know, that is right there in one of the, you know, largest oh, yeah. city uh, in our country. But uh, talking more and more about trying to, you know, green uh, our cities, uh, and even there is a, a great uh, uh, organization here 
that uh, tried to plant plant more trees. That's encouraging people to plant trees called uh, Tree Toledo. That uh, you know, just trying to you know get more trees and, like you mentioned, uh, ecological uh, benefits uh, of trees, all the way from you know, impacting our health to you know, taking up you know uh, some of that urban pollution and even you know pollution wherever, mm-hmm. maybe even out in the parks. Well, uh, I uh, that's all a good thing. Yeah. Yeah, I, 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 this is all all very fascinating, and I've I've often thought that New York City couldn't survive without Central Park. I've I've often thought that you know if it weren't for Central Park, people in Manhattan would just simply go insane and you <laughs> know be unable to function. Um, I just wanted to to clarify one thing though, uh, when you were talking about forest bathing, that doesn't actually involve disrobing, right? I mean. Or, <laughs> I guess it's so maybe. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is a good question, right? It it, it doesn't uh, okay. at least All the right. way that we do it at uh, the Wood County Parks. No, <laughs> yeah, because yeah. I know some this, some people would be <laughs> uncomfortable with that. I, I know. So, so the, <laughs> whoa, 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 that's too far out there. <laughs> yeah. So uh, it, it, it it's an uh, uh, an immersion. Uh, I think maybe I could say that um, you are uh, psychologically disrobed, but not <laughs> physically. Huh. This road. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Interesting. All right. <laughs> that makes sense. So yeah, it, 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 it's immersive, but uh, not not immersive in you know like the, the Turkish baths or something. Or, right. or your... <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> okay. Um, so if anyone else has some questions for Jim, uh, the lines are open at eight six six two four zero one zero six five. What do you think about this whole mind body? forest connection do you think this is a, a lot of hogwash or is this something that sounds interesting to you does it sound like you know i've i've kind of thought that all along um yeah give us a call yes so uh, uh ranger jim are we allowed to call you ranger jim because i feel like that would be fun <laughs> you can you can call me ranger jim we, we say uh, like at the, at the county parks because you know everyone uh, to most visitors everyone's a ranger and so the national parks Pretty much everyone is a ranger. You have like your law enforcement <laughs> ranger, your uh, you know your your naturalist ranger, your uh, habitat you know uh, ranger, you know stewardship habitat. So at the parks, we're naturalists. Our, our rangers are not called the park police. They do that you know the law enforcement patrolling <laughs> things. But uh, let, let's go with ranger Jim. There like we it. go. Yeah. So um, what are some of the ways that you encourage people uh, during the forest therapy to? Uh, kind of open their senses, get more out of it, the experience, than just, you know, the standard slap on your earphones and race walk over the asphalt part of the park <laughs> procedure? Yeah. Yeah, no, it, it, it's very, uh, it's kind of like a, a guided sort of meditation, and, and it's kind of parts where uh, the instructor is sort of, you know, leading you, kind of, kind of prompts uh, to, you know, to do things to kind of put you in a frame of mind. And then they kind of are, of course, a long spaces where there is kind of silence, and you're on the, on your own a little bit. So kind of have that that coming together with the instructor, with the other participants, and then it kind of sends you out a little bit. You do some of your own, kind of, uh, using that prompt to uh, put you in a certain frame of mind. And um, I think this was kind of uh, interesting to me. I, I think we're uh, maybe at a conference. I was hearing something about you know. Uh, while taking a walk, you know, like out, out in the parks, you know, you know, really uh, use your your senses. They're encouraging people to kind of use their their, their senses and kind of uh, you know explore things, really pay attention. And, and I was kind of thinking, so everyone like doesn't do that. Like I, I'm always doing this. I guess maybe it's my job. But I'm always <laughs> hearing almost to the point like I'm using my senses too much. That I, I'm trying to identify every bird and every insect and what's this and that. And when you go on a hike. It, it, uh, what we call this, we're uh, a part with county parks, and a lot of our staff are a part of the natural or national association of interpretation, that's nature interpretation of languages. Mm-hmm. But um, mm-hmm. you go on on a hike with them, and you barely get like two feet before you're interrupted by seeing something and spending like half an hour there talking about it. And then you go another two, and it's like, oh my gosh, this is just the worst. You go with them like a naturalist on a hike and you don't go anywhere. So sometimes you even almost have to turn off your brain a little bit. Like, I'm just going to experience things. Maybe a little bit more massively, rather than getting really stirred up by every uh, cicada and, and, and mm-hmm. bird and <laughs> so, uh, thing there. But uh, yeah, so a little less analytical and just a little much more 
Not so much. Check out those trifoliate serrated edges and things. <laughs> <laughs> right. And that is it. And I think about that often. I often compare it to kind of like, uh, well, since I know there's uh, on uh, 106.5 here, so lots of sports centric, that when you're uh, like you're an announcer and you're announcing the game and, you know, and it can compare it to like leading a nature hike that, you know, uh, sometimes there's a big uh, there's a big play. There's, there's a home run, you know, touchdown, uh, and you want to keep like you know talking and talking and talking. Like, and sometimes, I think I was hearing one of the you know the famous sports broadcasters. Like, sometimes you just need to be quiet. Yeah, like, mm-hmm. just be quiet. You hear the roar of the crowd. <laughs> and right. and like sometimes you don't always have to point out every little thing that that you know about and this and like let's just walk a little bit. I think about that on the on the hiking for health programs too. Like, let's nice. just like walk and be. And maybe I'll see a thing that I know about or I'm going to point out, but I'm not, I'm not going to. I'm going to try to point out the, the like, really most exciting things or the, maybe the most interesting things because mm-hmm. there's different levels of, like, interest on, like, you know, uh, you know my, my spouse might have dragged me along on this, you know, hike or, you know, I'm just very superficially interested in all, in all this nature stuff more here for the exercising. They try to find the, kind of the most exciting, interesting things. you got to pick those out rather than trying to over- over interpret, over over mm-hmm. new things, and you know, stopping every two feet, like I talked about. Yep. All right, well, all right, well, thanks, Jim. This has been a a fascinating discussion, and uh, I really appreciate you being on. And um, I, I guess one one final question is: um, Do you think that this uh, this nature health connection? Do you think we're just sort of starting to scratch the the surface of this, or do you think, you know, okay, we found out about the tree, the tree chemicals, you know, I, so we've got that benefit, and you know, and that's it, or do you think there's, do you think more research is going to happen in this area, and do you think it's sort of leading us to a an interesting place? Yeah, no, I I think you're right, on it, Joe. I think we are just at the beginning, and um, can I? I'll connect it sort of like to the moon, the moon landing here. Just oh, good, <laughs> because that's day. our theme for the sh- for today's show. So, <laughs> right. Yeah, good. Yeah, <laughs> which is pretty spe- uh, pretty spectacular, and that um, you know always kind of you know aspiring you know to, to those things you know aspiring to you know to go to the moon. And I was just you know watching First Man, like wow, what it was so long ago that uh, technology was so primitive. It's amazing they were able to to make it and. Uh, I think the more that we learn about you know, about nature and you know our impact on nature and, and nature's kind of impact on us, especially and its important importance to us, um, that I think we're just at kind of at the beginning, at the surface of, of kind of understanding these things and its importance to us. Oftentimes we kind of like to separate them. Okay, there's there's the people, and okay, we're doing our thing, and like nature's out there, and we interface with with that nature. And really, I, I think anymore like. I mean, we are we are nature. We we are a part of of this world, and uh, yeah. If we don't, you know, take care of it to drive those benefits and really kind of sustain life, our life on planet Earth, as well as you know all the other plants and insects and animals and, and creatures, uh, we could be in trouble. So I I do think that we're just kind of on the beginning to, to understanding uh, this kind of uh, impact uh, on us the benefits uh, of it and there's so much just like you know space exploration there, there's so much more to learn and understand uh, there will always be more and more i'm in this job more and more to realize boy i, I don't really know a whole lot i'm <laughs> not even sure i'm qualified to be doing this whole thing but All right. um yeah it, it, there is so much and uh, of course it's an endless source of, of interest and, and fascination and yeah. lifelong curiosity so science yeah kind of led us away from nature but now science itself is kind of leading us back to nature. So uh, that's really, yes. really fascinating discussion, Jim. And and uh, hope we'll have you on the future to talk about some other stuff. But uh, Rebecca, any yeah, thanks so much. Yeah, any last thoughts or? I, uh, bye, Ranger Jim. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, thanks. Yep. Green. We'll see if, if you, you are interested. Win County Parks. More information at wcparks.org. All right, great. Have a great day, Jim. Yeah, thanks so much, Joe, Rebecca. I appreciate it. Take care. You bet. Bye-bye. Bye. All right. That was Jim Witter, and we were very happy to have him on, just as we are very happy to have um, our sponsors. And, and today, 
Uh, we're going to talk about my, our, usually I talk about the Wood Counties first, but this week to sort of do a little separation, I'm going to talk about uh, DeMar Consulting first. DeMar Consulting is a computer consulting company that will come to your home and they will help you solve your computer problems. They will help you, let's say you have a computer that's not communicating with your printer or um, you have somehow finally or and somehow you just stop being able to access your email. Uh, those are the sorts of things that instead of living with and suffering with, uh, you should call someone who knows what they're doing. And uh, they, everyone at DeMar Consulting has a degree in computer science, so you know, you know that they know what they're talking about. And uh, there's a couple ways to get a hold of DeMar Consulting. One is through their website, which is simply demarconsulting.com. That's D-E-M-A-R-E. F O R, or excuse me, not F O R, just D E M A R E consulting dot com, or you can call them or text them at four one nine nine seven three three thousand. Did you just forget to, how to spell your last name, Joe? No, I just <laughs> added more on to my last oh, name. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I, I just uh, you know, it, it, and although I am not Demar Consulting, this is right. this is someone who. I guess I could admit it's a member of my family. There you know, go. it's his business, but um, we're very happy to sponsor him because he's good. You know, if he was no, if he wasn't any good, I actually wouldn't have him as a sponsor, even though he's a member of my family. But he is good, so we're happy to do this. Uh, and then our other sponsor for this hour is uh, the Wood County Park District. The Wood County Park District is a natural resources conservation agency. They protect natural spaces, maintain quality green spaces, provide engaging programming, and they teach people to love and respect nature, restore wildlife habitats, and they lead outdoor adventures. Wood County Parks protects 20 parks and nature preserves around Wood County, and they're open from 8 a.m. to 30 minutes past sunset every day of the year. And um, we have coming up some interesting events. On August 10th, there's going to be one of the self-care Saturdays that uh, Jim Witter was just talking about, and you can actually try out this forest therapy, which is practicing the connection with yourself and the earth, and by practicing this connection, as you heard, you reduce your stress, you you reduce depression, anxiety, blood pressure, and heart rate. Uh, It can help with symptoms of OCD and ADHD and several other acronyms. Um, It can increase your sense of well-being. It boosts your immunity and uh, give you mental clarity. They can help with your creativity and concentration. Uh, that program will cost $15, and you would go to register for that at wcparks.org. That's wcparks.org, or call the Wood County Park District at 419-353-1897. And then if you don't have $15, there's going to be a very similar event, August 23rd, uh, from 10 a.m. to 11.30 p.m. at the Black Swamp Preserve. And that, again, you would join a naturalist for exercise and the wonder of watching seasonal changes. These hikes offer a true mind-body connection. And sign up for one week, or there's also, uh, there's two of them actually happening on August 23rd. One is going to be at Otsego Park, and uh, the other is going to be at the Black Swamp Preserve. So whichever of those parks you like better, And again, you register at wcparks.org, or you can call the Wood County Park District at 419-353-1897. So thanks to all our sponsors. All right. Well, now we get to move on to talk about something which we just have to keep talking about on this show, which is House Bill 6, the the, the horror that that won't go away. this past week was uh, an incredibly intense development with House Bill 6. The Ohio State Senate passed it. Uh, it went past 19 to uh, 12, and uh, three Democrats voted for it, amidst all the Republicans. And uh, the, they, they actually made it worse before they, they passed it. Oh, they, dear. Yeah, they... Um, they added more charges for the coal plants because, Lovely. you know, coal plants need more money, obviously. And, you know, since they have control over the, our electric bills, uh, unfortunately, 
for them. They, they, they got, and for us, they got greedy. They're like, you know, we're, we screw it. We're just going to stick it to everybody on this bill. And so they added these additional coal charges. So now the coal plants are going to get like half a billion dollars. Is the one in Indiana still included? Oh, yeah, yeah. They, they throw in some more in neighboring states that have nothing to do with us except for pollute us. <laughs> Not yet. But, oh, you know, okay. but, the, you know, they, it, who knows? They may add riders to it. I don't know. But um, one thing they realized just as they were about to pass it, there was all this drama. Uh, I was watching it on the Ohio channel as they were doing the vote and they kept cutting out and taking recesses and it'd be like 15 minute recess, 10 minute recess. And then word would come. They're working on uh, amendments and and, you know, which kind of gets your hope up like they're going to improve it. Right. Mm-hmm. But, but no, the amendments all made it worse. But the and then uh, one really dramatic thing that happened is when they actually did the vote, when they they came back from the the break, where they were showing Ohio Channel was just showing that picture of the state house, and all of a sudden they're showing people and gavels and 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 roll calls, but there was no sound. So <laughs> so there was no actual audio as the vote itself was taken, and and that was just and apparently the power went out. In the state house, just as they started uh, debating House because, Bill Six, because the nuclear industry is doing such a wonderful job, right? So, right. You know. So, <laughs> so all this stuff happened, but apparently the most dramatic um, uh, amendment that got put forward was from a call from the governor. Governor Dewine called down to the Senate because um, it turned out that they they kept adding more charges for the the Dukes and the coal, and the Republicans' whole justification for this, the one rationalization that, no, what we're doing really does make sense, and it's not just us being super corrupt and bought out by First Energy. What they, what they, they, Their one justification was this will lower people's electric bills because getting rid of the energy efficiency standards and getting rid of the renewable energy portfolio removes the charges for those from their bills. And so the charges we're adding for the coals and the nukes aren't going to be as big, and so... Net people will save money. Well, they in the final version they added so many charges that it turned out people's electric bills are going to go up. They're actually now charging more to bail out the nukes and the coal than they were to give us renewable energy and energy efficiency. Yeah. And um, so the governor called down and said, "You guys, this is going to take effect." In 2020, during the presidential election year, <laughs> he said people are going to be, you know. Up at arms because they're going to see their electric bills going up to pay for dukes of coal, and we're going to be asking them to vote for our candidate for, you know, and and so. But the so, nuclear en- in energy industry said to do this, so right. Well, even though it's dumb, so they were caught between a rock and a hard place. Oh my! So you know what their solution was? That this this dramatic last minute amendment, uh-huh. it, the the increase isn't going to take effect until two months after the election. Well, that's really great that they're they're <laughs> focusing so much on the public good and the interest of their constituents. Right, as don't poor, you think that's right, because, clearly their primary consideration? <laughs> yeah, I know. And uh, I, during the hearings, I I told them, you know, if you're really concerned about people being able to pay their electric bills, why don't you raise their minimum wage? <laughs> there we <laughs> give go. them a little more money, and then they can pay their electric bills and don't have to worry about saving this dollar fifty, which was you know saving. Ohioans billions of dollars because of increased efficiency. Yeah, which it is whether if you got to choose between uh, food and your air conditioning stay on, I'd go with the air conditioner, frankly, and that choice will get made by some people. Yeah, yeah. Well, and so it passed the Senate, the, the amended version that the had DeWine's fingerprints all over it. And and, um, <laughs> and then they sent it back to the House to immediately vote it into law, but it but by this time, it was Wednesday night. It was like 7, 8 in the evening. And uh, a lot of the lawmakers had already gone home. And so they didn't vote on it. And so they scheduled the vote for August 1st. So now, because the, the House, even though this is a House bill, it passed the House once already, the Senate passed a version which is so different, the House has to re-approve it. Okie dokie. And so now we're we're back in limbo where where it's been approved by one house. Now there's all kinds of rumors flying. Some people are saying it didn't get voted on because Householder no longer has the votes, mm. that people have been taking so much heat from this. Uh, apparently I've been I've heard from uh, House of Representatives, people that have made public statements, that 
the uh, calls have been four to one against House Bill 6 and that the phones have just been ringing off the hook for months now. And so it's possible that some lawmakers who voted for it the first time in the House have gotten cold feet and may not vote for it the second time. That's one possibility. Now, the official story, what Householder says, is that, oh, he's got the votes. The people just weren't there. They'd already gone home for their, their July break, and so that's why they're waiting till August 1st to vote on it. It's not because we're trying to, you know, coerce more people and give them more bigger bribes or whatever. Yeah. Um, but Householder is a liar. <laughs> yeah. So there is a good chance that this is that this is now still in threat and that it may actually, again, not pass. But um, The viewers are missing my wicked crocodile grin, aren't they, Joe? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, they are. And and some more eye rolling, some impressive eye rolling, <laughs> yes. too. Uh, so, that's, Talented. so that's the status. It's passed the House once. It passed the Senate. And now it's waiting to pass the House the second time. And, and um, DeWine has said he's going to sign it no matter what it looks like. He doesn't care as long as First Energy gets its billions. He's there with his pen. In fact, I think he's going to be waiting outside the House chamber with a pen in hand, you know, ready to, to, to sign it as soon as it, it's printed off. You know. Because we elected a walking garbage fire. <laughs> Governor. Well, that's a that's a that's an opinion. And, uh, <laughs> a little, yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I, it, I I'm trying to think of ways that we haven't. Nothing has come into mind. <laughs> but if you ha- if you can if you if you could defend Dewine here if you could defend uh, you know the the those that are voting for House Bill Six give us a call eight six six two four zero one zero six five we welcome dissenting opinions so. Um, all right, so that's the House Bill 6 update. Let me see if we had anything else. Uh, one, I wanted to quickly touch on um, the fact that it's so hot. You know, is it hot enough for you, Rebecca? Very nearly. Yeah, and uh, just some interesting things that happened because of the heat. Uh, the hottest the, the where, places in the earth right now where it's the highest above normal is in the far north, actually. You think we've got it bad down here. Well, in places that it's never been 90 and 100 degrees, now it's getting up to 90 and 100 degrees. And one story that didn't get covered much, this past week, uh, 54 people in Quebec died from the heat. Oh, dear. Yeah, and uh, Quebec is really far north. It's way up where the Hudson River meets the Atlantic Ocean. And uh, I actually vacationed there last year. It was uh, It's a beautiful area. Lots of birch trees, which we've lost a lot of our birch trees because it's gotten too hot. Um, but, yeah, 54 people died. In Siberia, it's 40 degrees above normal. And then in Africa, this past week was recorded the highest temperature ever recorded on the surface of the Earth, 124.3 degrees. And so, you know, the people that say there's no global warming – say oh there's always been records set and there's always been really hot days and there's always been high humidity and yes but these records are bigger yes (laughs) they're much bigger than the previous like we don't want to have records set every year of high temperatures that's kind of not healthy for people right and so the solution of course is we have to get off of carbon step one and uh, which means not giving bailouts to coal plants (laughs) i mean that should be fairly obvious. And uh, then we we are going to have to plant a lot of trees, you know, we're going to have to we're going to have to do a lot of things. But one point we always make on for a green future is that these things don't have to be sacrifices. We don't have to all of a sudden all of us go out and start uh you know, starving ourselves or you know, we don't have to give up the things that we love in order to save the planet. Uh, and in fact, once we start saving the planet, we're going to find that doing that is easier and it's better and it's healthier and it's safer and and it's just, you know, better in every way. And uh, my own personal experience with that is that uh, we got a new car last week and uh, our our my father-in-law, my wife's father helped us get it. And we got a Pacifica hybrid, a plug-in Pacifica hybrid. And we can go 30 miles without using any gas at all. 
and you know it's a big van so we're really comfortable it fits us and our dog and our stuff and and our father-in-law is is walker and you know everybody and everything can fit in this thing and yet it gets better mileage than my honda civic which is a you know it's a nice little car with a good gas mileage better than almost the most cars on the road today but uh also going towards a sustainable future is actually more comfortable and and better and you know just we just have to do it but one thing we did find is that we're having a struggle finding charging places uh, we went down to Wapakoneta there are no charging ports in the entire city of Wapakoneta wow and um you know so the infrastructure has to be put there but once it is put there we could have charged our car fully at home driven out to Wapakoneta charged it up at while we were doing our fun stuff in Wapakoneta and driven most of the way home without using any gasoline at all. Uh, and that would not have hurt. <laughs> yeah, and know. people in this city are really, you know, the young people with entry-level jobs or the old people who've been fired so that they could hire young people for cheaper. <laughs> they, they, I really hear a lot of people, you know, struggling when gas prices are high and being like, oh, my gosh, I st- there's nothing I can do to cut back. I still have to spend X amount of gas getting to work and back every day. Right. You know, what what, what am I going to do here? Right. So we have to get on that. We have to solve that problem the way they solved uh, the problems of the moon landing. And I know that we will because every week I get a letter from the future from my great-great-granddaughter, Marie I, who's living in the year 2299. And She's very late getting back to you today, just a couple minutes before the show. Well, she is, <laughs> so I'm going to have to read a little quickly, but... Um, Remember, she didn't send her letter last week. It was the only time she's missed. And the explanation is in this week's letter. So, dear great-great-grandpa, thank you for saving our lives. I still can't quite believe what happened. As you know, Michael and I were vacationing, taking a dirigible cruise over the Bering Straits to watch blue whales. Out of nowhere, a tremendous storm blew up. We were getting tossed all over in the cabin. I wedged myself down between two seats that were bolted to the floor and saw one of the observation windows cracked by huge hail. The captain decided to try to get above the storm, but as he was pushing the dirigible up, it started getting coated by ice. Next thing I knew, we were diving back down, and I could see nothing but the churning ocean through the cracked window. Then we were hit by lightning, and all the lights in the cabin went dead, and the captain lost control of the dirigible. The huge airship started spinning as it fell, and I could see... What I now know was Little Diomede Island wasn't too far off. Michael was squeezing my hand as we hit the water. The cracked window smashed open and freezing seawater poured in. Michael pulled on my arm and we swam out to the space where the window was, under the shadow of the slowly deflating dirigible, and up into the storm-tossed sea. Other people kept popping up from under the water, and the wind was actually pushing the, the airship towards the shore. We had to swim for our lives. It was only 100 yards, but it was the longest 100 yards of my life. Once we were on shore, Michael was amazing. He took charge of the people, directing everyone to a sheltered space. Then he went back with some other people and saved three or, saved four or five other people who were still trying to get off out of the water. All in all, we only lost five out of 100 people. Then I noticed a cairn, a pile of stones near the shore. On an urge, I opened it up, and I found a huge plastic tub that you had put there in the year (laughs) 2021, and it was full of needed medical supplies, blankets, food. It got us through until rescuers could arrive. Thank you, great-great-grandpa. You've been a big help. So, uh, love, Marie I. It's like an action movie. Who should play her? (laughs) (laughs) So, but I guess this means now I have to somehow figure out how to get to Little Diomede Island in yeah. the Bering Straits in the year 2021 and put a cairn there. So she's given me a task, I guess. Uh, all right. Well, so that was our exciting letter from the future. Uh, and remember, Marie I is writing from a time when we've solved all these problems, where we've figured out how to have a carbon-free economy and uh, have a, a beautiful, healthy relationship with nature without giving up science, without giving up creature comforts. And uh, if you have questions for Marie I, uh, you can ask her, and I will include them in my letters to her. I send her a letter every week, too, from the past, um, by going 
uh, by writing it joe at joe demar for a green future dot org. You can send to that email or you can look us up on Facebook for a green future. You can message us through Facebook. We are also on, uh, we have a website which is joe demar for a green future dot org. And again, demar is spelled D E M A R E. And, um, we would love to hear from you. And of course, you can call or text anytime at 419-973-5841. So thank you. That's our show for today. Thank you, Rebecca. It's been fun. And uh, this is Joe Damar signing off. Have a good week, everybody. Bye. I like birds and things. Creeping and crawling. Won't trade no more.